So welcome to the studio. This is a bit of a different video. I've got my co-star Timo here with me today, head of cyber offensive research at Cyber R&D Labs. Um, and he watched my video on do RFID shields work and he thought I was wrong. Now I will admit up front, and this is me setting myself up for, for being wrong, that uh, the equipment I used was very basic and not really specific for credit cards. Um, and also I was saying that card clash was all you needed and that would protect the world. Um, and for something I'll post on, on social, it seems as though my, my wallet may actually have been more RFID protecting than, than maybe I thought it was. Anyway, let's hand over to Timur, let's go get into the video and let's just see what's going on. Do you want to do a quick introduction of yourself? Hi, Quentin, thanks. Yeah, um, yeah my name is Timur Yunusov. I'm a head of offensive security research at Cyber R&D Lab. It's not about whether RFID shields work or, or they don't work. It's more about what you actually can get from the wallet without RFID shields or what RFID shields basically protect you from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when, whenever you go on like Visa or MasterCard website, they say, or any major banks, they say that that contactless is the most modern, secure form of payments and you can't just uh, use this uh, any kind of proxmark or any other readers to steal the information which will be enough to make payments. And so this is one idea, one approach, yeah, and the second is like, hey, we need these shields to protect your cards, mm. otherwise fraudsters will be able to steal data and conduct fraudulent payments, yeah, yes. so this is like quite radical, both, both, both views are quite radical, yeah, so yes. we need to be somewhere in the middle and understand what actually can be done and how it can be done, which is more important, and how, how to prevent these things. And there's another aspect of fraud as well, which I believe, which is I bought these things for virtually nothing on Amazon, these little protective wallets, and in my local shop, um, they're nine pounds for three or something, and I bought 50 of them for, for virtually nothing. So this is, yeah, this is a selling of fear essentially. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's important to go right to the bottom to understand what this is all about. So uh, we have we have a wallet without uh, any kind of NFC protection. No, that's just a plastic wallet. I put plastic a bit of, wallet. I put a bit of our, um, gaffer tape on it to hide whose wallet it was. We have, we have NFC card inside and we have any simple N NFC reader, in, in this case, yeah. this is a m mobile phone, yeah. So we obviously can read this data, but the question is what exactly we read. So first thing that we read is uh, card details, card number, and as it's called, track, track to equivalent, which is the equivalent of data which is written on the max track Max itself. track data, yeah. yes. It's track two data, yeah. And like, 20 years ago, this data in the UK was exactly on, on, on the chip, well, as opposed to NFC, which is basically NFC is the second form of chip, yeah, just mm. uh, sent over radio as opposed to mm. physical connection to the chip. And this track to equivalent data, like 20 years ago, was absolutely identical to MaxStripe, actually, mm. which you see the problem here, yeah, so you, you read data via chip, you read data via NFC, write it on, on, on the actual max stripe and here you go, you have yeah. a fully functional clone. Obviously when banks realized that this is a problem, they started implementing different data on NFC and mm. on a chip and that's uh, different authentication code CVV2 and that sort of helped from creating functional clones. However, mm. banks, uh, I would say 10-15% of banks still allow making transactions using data from NFC or from EMV. Right, right. So, and, and explicitly Visa, MasterCard, they all say, hey, banks, you need to look at the data and see the consistency. Yeah, yeah. if the data is stolen, if the data is read by NFC and you mm. see that this piece of information is belong, belongs to NFC, why does it appear on, on MaxStripe transaction? Mm. Yeah, and if it appears on MaxStripe transaction, this kind of transaction should be declined. And as I said, this happens in 90% of the banks, which is good, but we still have 10% of the banks mm. who don't do pro proper job. Mm. Uh, 
uh, next is like the, the how, how NFC and AMV uh, payments work. They all generate cryptogram for, for each transaction. Mm. Yeah, they take amount, current date, put it in, in a cryptographic checksum, yeah, three yeah. dash, uh, creates a checksum and send it to the terminal. Terminal obviously isn't able to check it. Acquire a bank, send it to Ishian Bank. Ishian Bank put this data to, as it's called, HSM, Hardware Secure Module, where every magic, where all this magic happens, <laughs> that decodes, checks that the yep. mount wasn't tampered, everything is fine. And if, it, and if it's good, and if the customer have enough money on, on the account, they will answer, yes, okay, I approve the transaction, yep. and, and yep. you can go away with, with your goods. Now, the problem is exactly here. So it's, it's not ideal mechanism of protection that's just the protection from like silly mass fraud how it was related to to max tribe mm. 20 30 years ago yeah so emv nfc they never were created ideal form of protection yeah mm. so those they were just good enough to protect from mass fraud yeah but what we can do we actually can Still, information from a card once, as 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 is shown yep, you, yep. yeah, and and then we can use it on uh, our own, for example, compromised terminals like here mm. I have, to make fraudulent transactions. Yeah, not only one, not only two. We don't even need to know the exact mm. date, uh, the exact amount or exact date. Yeah. So I said that initially you need to put a specific amount and you need to put a specific date. But it's not the case, yeah. So you actually can do arbitrary amount and arbitrary mm -hmm. an arbitrary date. It doesn't need to be today. So you don't right. need to go on the tube with actual reader trying to do all these things. You can uh, imagine the worst you case. You capture the cards on one day and then use them on a. a imagine, day. imagine the worst situation. Someone with a really big antenna with with a lot of uh, radiation <laughs> on the tube goes along the, the whole carriage, collects a lot of data, then goes home, goes to another country and, and starts conducting fraud. Yeah, yeah. and this is, this is the worst imaginary situation. Next problem is that uh, if, if the fraud will remain low, it's not going to be thousands, thousands of pounds per transaction. So you keep uh, it under that threshold? That will be painful for banks to ask for chargebacks. Mm. Yeah, they will be like, because every file for chargeback costs to bank X, yeah, and, mm. and, and if fraud is lower than X, obviously for bank it's easier just to give money to, mm. to affected customer, yeah, and, and that, that is basically what, what happens and that what possibly can happen in the future with any of us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the thing is that people think that it will be extremely easy to track person who has opened his merchant account and post belongs to, yeah, and... Uh, but what you're saying is you can steal the data on one day, go somewhere else and then use it totally in a different country, different they, amounts, for different first, whatever. First of all, yes, and second is uh, nowadays, because everything is essentially online, I can actually open merchant account uh, on fake or uh, artificial identity, especially in the US, where you just buy social security number on the dark yeah, market. Not every and, single and that's bank it. is going to do it to the same degree they might do it in Europe, for example. And for example, what they like their main threshold is to keep max trap transactions low. Yeah. Mm. So if you will start doing max trap transactions and they will become fraudulent, you will be locked very, very quickly. However, mm. if you are talking about contactless transactions, like in this case, it will take a while to any kind of authorities or banks or merchant service providers to understand that this guy exactly conducting fraud. And by the mm. time they will they will get these ends, these people can disappear. And that what and then for pop example, up again in a different uh, guys later on. That what happens in Latin America. Yeah. Mm. So they were doing this kind of fraud. They were buying merchant accounts. They were obtaining it from a dark market or mm. whatever. And they put this data in transaction stream. Yeah. So this like you you actually here is absolutely different card, which which is which is yours actually. But yeah. But but but. Uh, it, 
when, when transaction, when I try to commit transaction, I actually put the data from this card or from other card or I just randomly mm -hmm. brute force cards. Yeah, and, and these things were going for months and for eight, for years. And only after that, people just come back and say, hey, uh, can you please stop doing fraudulent mm -hmm. transactions? And like uh, Brazilian government will try to find the specific merchant where this come from. By that time, this guy will disappear. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, so should we do a quick demonstration? Yeah, sure. So Timur, what are we gonna be doing today? So we're gonna try to use the information stolen from the card to actually commit fraudulent transactions. So what you did was you used that mobile phone to read the card that's just in this plastic wallet. Yeah. And put that away, so we don't need that anymore. Yeah, we presume that that happened yesterday. Okay. And uh, in a different country, and, uh, and I'm here with uh, point of sale which I use for my uh, fraudulent transactions and okay. actually I am able to manipulate data on, on this terminal so I'm putting actual data which goes to the issue and acquiring bank and this is quite a common situation in, in a while yeah so we have here absolutely different cards and you know this right yeah. and um, we have, for example, amount of, of, of one pound. Yeah, and I'm gonna show that I can do multiple transactions with only with, with data stolen only once days ago uh, on absolutely different different amount. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's start with one pound. We do the transaction. Uh, initially it reads data from this card and but but I'm just gonna re replace it with with the data which I'm stolen. Now we're not actually in this video going to show what's going on on his screen from my own card because we're not actually trying to have this as a how-to video on how to steal credit cards on how to steal and transactions. And you can see, yeah, I have that done. So I can see here. So that's what you've now done is without that card being anywhere near that reader, you've now charged a pound to that card. Yep. And now. Okay, well, it went through. We saw it go okay, through. Okay, let's there. let's 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 try to do two pounds now. I just need to do it quicker. Let's do two pounds now, and let's see if it comes through. And um, and then you're going to swap the cards over. Yeah, I'm going to swap the data of the cards. And oh, I think I need face ID. Here is two pounds, and this one is successful. And and that's I, that card over there that you've now charged here. And for example, last year we've done tests uh, for seven days in a row. Yeah. So every day I was charging and charging and charging, and banks don't notice the problem that information that was stolen is quite sort of constant yeah mm -hmm. so but due to how payments now work and how the industry works they prefer like uh, if if they will decline transactions which they should do that might cause in one percent of the cases that might cause inconvenience of the customers and they will start calling like being very angry and that what banks prefer uh yeah to to put down by uh doing what they do. Well, I have to say, I am convinced. I mean, I'm not sure if these kind of RFID blocking wallets are the way forwards, but um, an actual RFID blocking wallet, a leather wallet or a, or a purse or something that has the RFID blocking features in it, does seem to work, yeah. as, as I quite ably demonstrated by accident in a previous video. Uh, and that would stop this attack from happening. And you were saying this attack is prevalent. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely feasible and it's better to, to, to at least, so what I'm saying is good to understand what actually yeah. can be done and it's up to you, it's up to me to decide this balance of convenience, inconvenience of having RFID wallets because obviously if I have 
uh, not RFID protected wallet, I can just pay without taking card off. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's yeah, yeah. much easier. Yeah. If I use these devices, I need to have extra room in my wallet because my wallet is super tight. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, they normally don't, don't have extra space. And then for... you need to take it out of this. Yeah, yeah, to yeah. So, pay. and this is a balance for which, which you need to judge your own like yeah. do you want to have this extra security or not and if you have some if you look some some suspicious charges yeah some strange things that that you never committed you start asking like is it uh, can it actually be done with with this technology mm. nfc or env or or not well i mean i think you convinced me um i i, I now I've, I've seen the attack work i've seen the fact that these kind of devices do actually uh, protect your cards. Just be aware that if you do go to buy these things, um, don't go and buy them in your local corner shop. Just have a look on eBay, Amazon, and other retailers are available, and you'll find these kind of things all over the place. Uh, and my suggestion would be um, um, an open flip-top wallet like this, but with RFID protection in it, because then you could flip it out, read, close it, and then it's and then it's uh, then it's uh, blocked off. Yep. So thank you, Timur. Thank you for coming in and disproving. I, I love this. The fact that uh, something I put spent ages putting together was fatally flawed by the fact that one of my cards was just over the little RFID blocking logo. Um, and I'm just great to you've actually demonstrated in a very, very practical sense exactly how this attack works. So uh, thank you. So, thank uh, you. So Thanks. until next time, everybody, tell me what you think in the comments below. Have you been a victim of this kind of, uh, of this kind of attack? Do you know other ones that we should look into? Please let me know below. Please share this video on your social media and don't forget to like and subscribe.